All right, here we are. Uh, another episode of Let There Be Talk. Great guest today. Introduce yourself, my man. My name is Mike Kerr, and I play in a band called Royal Blood. Yes. Where, where are you? In, uh, on the road in a hotel somewhere? Both of those things, yeah. I'm in Austin, Texas. We're playing a show here tonight. Oh, where are you at? Stubbs or something? No, we played Stubbs last year. We're at um, the Moody Theater. Oh, oh yeah, the Moody Center. Oh, that's a good one. I love that. Yeah. yeah are you guys? Forward to it, man. Are you out headlining right now, or are you with somebody? We're headlining. Yeah. Excellent. I saw you guys. Uh, Bill Burr and I went and saw you guys at the Forum when you were opening with the uh, Queens of the Stone Age. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we came back and said, hey, dear, or whatever. But uh, and then uh, I had Ben on the show during the typhoon cycle. And uh, so it's good to have you here, bud. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, it's great to be here. How's the tour going? Really good. Yeah, it's uh, it's been really fucking long, but it's um, it's just been a really good vibe. Like, I feel like we haven't been able to tour like this long for a very long time. And uh, we're just in the zone at the minute. I feel like we're playing better than ever. And there's a real feeling like a real connectivity between the crowd and us. So um, yeah, we're in a really good zone at the minute. Yeah, especially after coming off that, you know, everybody off the COVID weird era, you know, you put out a record basically everybody that put out a record during that time, it just disappeared, you know, like Pearl Jam and uh, all these people that had put out these great records and then they just kind of disappeared. And uh, so it does feel kind of like it's back to normal now, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, just being able to play a record like while it's fresh is important, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I couldn't even imagine like you release a record and then you wait to tour it and you're like, we did that shit like two years ago. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a bit of that for sure. It's like when I, sometimes somebody will ask me to do an old joke, you know, I'm a comedian and I'll be like, oh man, I don't even know how that goes. Yeah, 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 right. Now, let's talk a little bit about the new record. I've been listening to it. It's fantastic uh back to the water below i really really like the back end of the record man like um uh how many more times there goes my cool and waves you know it, the back end's really kind of cool and dark i dig it thanks man yeah it feels like um the sort of second half we kind of settle into the stuff that doesn't that perhaps feels like more new territory for us. That kind of like Beatles y T almost like T some of it we think is quite T Rex sounding. And yeah, I don't know. It, like that music's always been a part of what we love. Um, but there just never was a I never felt like there was a place for it until now. So it's it's really cool to be able to go into those spaces. Yeah, you know, stuff like uh, There Goes My Cool, that's, it's kind of a Bowie-ish, kind of uh, Beatle-ish, you know, kind of space hog, you know, you know, it's got this cool vibe to it. Uh, and I found that a lot of people uh, have really dove back into the Beatles ever since that documentary came out, you know? Yeah, I was probably, I didn't watch the get back documentary when it was like first came out because you know when some sometimes everyone has a, has a strong opinion on something and you walk in you know, i always feel like i won't be able to form my own <laughs> like so i i was kind of i watched it uh, like much later and uh that's maybe i maybe that was kind of rubbing off on me a bit i don't know Oh, yeah. When people are hyping it up, dude, are you watching Dahmer? You got to be watching Dahmer. Oh, yeah. And after a while, you're like, I get it, man. I'll get to it. You know, I'm kind of doing yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. There's like so much shit that I'm sure is great. And everyone's like, you've got to see it. And I'm like, I won't get anything done. 
if I, if I watch all these things, they're like 10 seasons long. You're like, yeah. Yeah. I'll be writing any songs if we're doing that. Whenever I'm on tour, I can catch up on stuff on the bus, you know? Yeah, exactly. On the flight and all that shit. Yeah. 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 Are you guys on a, time to do it. Are you guys on a bus on this tour? Yeah, on a bus. We've done a, I think we've done like two flights on some of like the really long drives, but um, generally it's all been on a bus. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. Now I watched uh, some footage of you playing Glastonbury this year, man. That looked fire. Yeah, that's always a a big moment, um, especially being from England. You know, it's always uh, I don't know. It's sort of a big part of British culture, and um, it's, I mean, and not to mention that it's just fucking massive. So. Um, yeah, there's always a lot of weight on that one, and uh, it's super surreal playing it. But I guess like there's so much hype, and then when it comes to like the reality of actually doing it, um, it's it's okay. It just it just takes like a couple of songs to get into it, and then you're like, oh yeah, we're just doing we're just doing our thing. It's it's all cool. <laughs> well, not yeah. too much to overthink, overthink here, you know. What I always find on a big gig is it takes a few days to come down from it and you could be playing killer gigs after that, but you're, you're still like, man, Glastonbury, you know, or the guard Madison square garden or, or the forum or, or these monumental venues. And it's really quickly, you can forget like, shit, I'm in another killer venue right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you always get the sort of text through saying, oh, good luck tonight because you're playing in LA or London or New York. But you don't get that text any other time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When like, and arguably, like, I would say some of like my favorite shows of touring, kind of like never in those places, really. Yeah. Um, you always, yeah, because I don't know, it's, just, it's, it's silly to sort of expect major cities to have that vibe, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, there's so much weight put on those shows that when you get to somewhere like, say, you know, Arizona and and you're just cutting loose, you're just like, God, that was a great gig tonight because you're not like, oh, we're at the forum. Everybody's going to be here tonight. We got to. Yeah, you're just less. Yeah, you're less in your head about it and you can kind of let loose. We played in Dallas last night and it it ripped. It was so good. I think as well, like not being filmed, I think is a big part of it. Like when there's like a whole crew of cameras kind of surrounding you, it's never like, it's harder to like get into it and relax when you're like, it's hard to not become self-conscious, I think. Yeah, I feel like the best way to film something is just film like a couple weeks and then it's completely out of your mind, you know? Yeah, yeah. But when they're filming like one night, like say a concert or a comedy special, and they're like, okay, look, we've got all these cameras here. We got all this money. We got to fucking get it. And then you're just going like, oh, man. And it it could easily be a dud. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like when we're touring and stuff, um, we have someone filming and taking photos. We obviously know them and they're with us all the time. So it's kind of like they're saying, it's easy to just get into it. But yeah, Absolutely. if it's like in the middle of a tour where well, suddenly all these cameras show up, yeah, it's hard to kind of act normal. Now, are you guys uh, two piece on this tour? Or do you have anybody extra sitting in? Yeah, we have a keys player uh, who's an old friend of ours who he comes on for about six tracks i think some of the new stuff just has extra extra layers and stuff um we don't um we don't play to like a backing track or a click track so we always kind of prefer that i anything added to be live um that song waves you were talking about we actually we actually need we actually have a fourth player um and what we've been doing is bringing on um, someone from the opening band to come on and play with us. So that's been really cool. So that's the kind of first time we have four people playing together on stage. And 
it's a cool moment because it kind of it feels like it brings the show together um i feel like sometimes there can be like a separation between the opening band and the headline and um yeah so that's that's been a really good yeah that song's been brilliant live it's been a good opportunity to kind of yeah create a nice moment yeah that that, that i think that really is makes a tour cool when you're out like I used to play music and you're touring and then you at the end of the night, like I just did a comedy tour with Marcus King. And at the end of the night, we all got together because I used to sing and everybody played. It's kind of like, you know, the last waltz. Yeah. Everybody's up there. It's festive. And and the crowd yeah, yeah, loves yeah. it. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love that vibe. Um, so, we, yeah, we started doing that this, yeah, this, this album. And uh, yeah, hopefully we get to carry on. And it all, everyone plays, it's funny, everyone plays that same part differently and everyone brings a totally different energy to the stage. It's really interesting because I'm so used to just playing with Ben. So having that kind of, yeah, different energy every night is brilliant. Who is opening for you guys? This band called Hot Wax. Hot Wax. From the UK. Yeah. Um, they're a three-piece kind of punk rock band they're super young they're like 19 but they're proper shredders um yeah it kind of reminds me of like the yeah yeah yeahs and nirvana um and the pixies they're really cool um it's been going down great oh man i i, I love the yeah yeah yeahs holy shit man same. yeah same I think Karen O is one of the greatest ever to do it. It's so wild, you know? Yeah. That uh, Meet Me in the Bathroom documentary I thought was really good. For me, oh. that yeah, yeah, yeah is kind of seen and that, the moments in that documentary of them really, uh, really resonated with me. I thought just reminded me of how powerful that music is, you know? Yeah, that was a great era, you know, because... It was. You had this... You got the 80s, you know, which was a uh, quote unquote hair metal or whatever. Then you get into the 90s of grunge and other stuff like Blind Melon or Counting Crows and stuff. And then music's just kind of hanging out for a while. Uh, Hip hop starting to get very big. And then here comes the Strokes, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, Jet. Um, uh, OCD. Interpol. Mm -hmm. You know? And then it was just like, wow, man, Franz Ferdinand, you know, Ferdinand, mm -hmm. and leather jackets were happening and guitar again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just and great songwriting to kind of hold it all together. Oh, my God, um, the songwriting was fantastic. Amazing. And it's, and it's all lasted. Like, I don't listen back to any music from that era and feel like it's aged in any way. It, it it still feels great. Oh, yo, it, it, there's no aging of it at all, man. And and I was talking about it recently on my podcast that when I hear last night by the Strokes, which is you know their hit, they they have many hits, but that was the big one. Whenever I hear it, I go, oh well, that's so long ago now. This is classic rock, and they have a hit in the classic rock world that just plays forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I've caught them live a couple of times, and it's yeah, it's phenomenal. It just yeah. there's just no. It feels like they're hiding behind nothing. It's just kind of great parts, great players. Um, it's just so old school, you know. Yeah. Now let's get into a little bit about if uh, people have not seen you live. You guys are a two piece band. This uh, that was a big big thing over the last 20 years some two-piece bands were coming around and uh and now i look at it as like oh god so smart you know there's not other band members to pay you can yeah, afford, yeah. you can afford to tour <laughs> you know i know i know i, I never wanted to be in a two-piece honestly i never i mean i love i'm a fan of so many two-piece bands but that i, I grew up playing the piano so to me like harmonies and layers and I love Queen so I love really layered recordings and so the idea of like being in a band that was like raw 
I just I never thought I would end up in something like that. But I never thought I'd even play the bass. You know, I just wound up trying it one day and, and going through and making some cool sounds. And and by the time me and Ben started jamming, it was just a bit like, oh shit. <laughs> Yeah. This is this is too like this is too fun to ignore and put down. So um yeah, it's and I I think I kind of just started enjoying the musical challenge of it because there's like a sonic challenge of like how do you like make this sound like it's not too big? How do you make this sound full? But then there's a musical one as well of how do you kind of how do you make interesting and captivating songs with such few ingredients, you know? And it kind yeah. of, it, it just became really inspiring and it made me think a lot about art that does that and I'm a big foodie, so I, I love food that does that, where I go to restaurants and there's three things on the plate and it's like mind blowing. I'm obsessed with like simplicity and, and minimalism. and um, So it just kind of, yeah, really turned me on basically. And uh, and it's funny, I think as the bands progressed, we sort of, it was very strict at the beginning. We were very like, this is no, like, no layers, no overdubs. And um, and I think as time's gone on, we've turned that rule off every, every now and then. And uh, yeah, it's been really liberating. And it feels like now we can do both. Now we can make songs that are super raw and have nothing you know, few components and we can make things like you were saying like there goes my cool which has you know a bit more going on. Um but I think even when we add layers there's an element of like we're still chasing the ideas that are simple and I always think of it like that game Jenga, you know? It's oh, like yeah. keep just like keep removing pieces until it like starts to like wobble and then we kind of stop. And that's kind of what we do with our song. I mean, that's like my favorite architecture. I think that they, uh, I love, you know, mid-century, you know, glass, wood, and just really sparse minimalist houses, you know? And uh, sometimes it just is the best way to go. People, you know, they layer on so much things in life in general to where they're yeah. just bogged down with clutter, you know? I know, man, absolutely. It's fucking wild. Now, I was watching you uh, when I saw you guys. Like, what is that bass? Is it like an old melody maker, Gibson? Or what, what is that bass? So it's a bass that Fender made for me, like, around the first album. Um, I, st I started out playing these, like, $300 short-scale basses that you can just get from Guitar Center. And I still I still use them live. But then kind of Fender kind of reached out to me and were like, we can make you a bass if you want. And honestly, I was so, I still am in a way, I was so naive to kind of the bass world. I didn't really know like what I liked. I didn't know what, I was just kind of using whatever. And uh, so they reached out and we agreed on like a short scale bass, which is kind of like a smaller bass than, than normal. Right. But, and they sent me this Jaguar and uh, that's kind of like, I use that for most of the show now. So it, it feels like a guitar. It feels small and it feels fun to play. Um, and then recently we've just made it a signature model. So it's kind of now that's like officially my kind of my own bass design, which is really cool. Oh, that's amazing. And then what amps, yeah. are, what amps are you using? So that's like changed a lot over the years. I, I kind of my main amplifier is a Fender Supersonic. Oh yeah. Um and there's usually three of them. And I have I can send different sounds to each amplifier and kind of combine them and make why you know, like really layered sounding um tones, but just from the same instrument. So that was kind of the thing that made me feel like we could be a two piece in it would feel it would sound big um just getting those layers in straight away oh it definitely sounds big i mean i thought it was a guitar the whole time till i saw you live you know yeah yeah a lot of people 
I mean, that's kind of like what I was shooting for. Like, I realized that like, if this whole two piece thing with guitars had been done before and done so well, and and to be fair, there's you know there's I, I love like Death from Above and there's there's great there's great two piece bands that use bass as well. But it was like once I kind of had that like more guitar-y sound on the bass, so I kind of felt, oh maybe this is like where maybe this is where I belong, kind of in this in this world. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's super original. I mean, you know, uh, a two-piece with bass, and, and you know, you can go all over the place with the with the array of pedals these days, man. You can make it sound like anything—a keyboard. Uh, you know, you can make it sound like uh, turntables, anything. You can, yeah. And uh, I think I kind of go falling out of love with that idea of pedals and sounds and stuff. But I think the thing that I've always drawn back to is what I'm actually fucking playing. You know, yeah. <laughs> like there's always a point where you're like, it's all about the riff I'm playing and the, and the melodies I'm writing and the content of the material. Like if that bit is strong, then the next bit's kind of making it sound cool with like the fun bit. Sometimes like when I'm writing, I'll like keep it sounding really shit. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm kind of like really sold on the idea before like getting the pedals out and trying to like make it sound cool basically. How do you write? Do you write on the bass, just like laying it down that way? Or do you actually write on an acoustic and then figure it out how to play it as a two piece? Kind of both. Like sometimes it will start with like a beat that Ben's kind of working on and I'll just sit there and like listen to it for hours on end and find a riff or a melody. And like this new album was, I spent a lot of time just on the piano, um, which I found a bit easier because you can put you can put sort of all of the information of the song into the, when you're at the piano. Yeah. Sometimes when you're just sitting there with a riff, you're like imagining all this other shit. So sitting at the piano for me was like, I, it's almost like I felt like I was doing my homework, you know, first and getting the kind of the hard bit done first. And then we would have like these complete songs at the piano and then we'd sort of transpose them into the band. That was a kind of cool way of writing. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if the song works on the piano, it's going to work no matter what. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I'll give you a good example. I love Chris Rock, a uh, comedian. And, you yeah, know, same. you see Chris Rock, uh, by the time you see his specials, he's really big, you know? He's like, oh, I said, look out, you know? He's like, ah, you know? But when he's working out the bits at like the comedy store, he's really like laid back, almost lethargic. And he's really seeing if the actual joke works before mm. he puts on any kind of sauce. You know, he doesn't need to try to sell it because then he doesn't really know if the joke works. And I learned so much from that, you know? That's really interesting. I, I, if I went to the comedy store a couple of weeks ago, Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, man. Who was this guy I saw? He was so... I've forgotten his name. Andrew Ginger oh. Guy. Andrew Schultz? Or yeah, Andrew Santino? No. Redhead? Yeah, Andrew Santino. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. He floored me. Yeah. And I felt... And I felt like... When I saw him, I felt like he did that. I felt like he came out and he wasn't running around. He wasn't... He just kind of stood there and I just, the material was so good. It's like, it didn't need that. And it, it, it floored me. Excellent. And it's funny, I, we, it's funny, me and my girlfriend were talking about that idea on the way out. Like that guy, his material is so good. I was like, it, it can, it survived just delivering it straight. Um, I'm sure, and I'm sure that's part, I don't know much about him, but I'm sure that's part of his style. But yeah, it kind of got me on that thought train. How'd you like the comedy store? It's cool, yeah. I, you know what? I've spent a lot of time at the comedy cellar in New York. Um, I spent, I've been trying to spend like as much time in New York as possible recently. Um, 
And it's funny, like, comparing them. I thought the Stella was great, though. It was really, really good. Um, it's definitely, like, a bit cleaner, isn't it? A bit more... The cellar? A bit or slick. The um, no, the store. The store feels a bit slicker. Um, but it was cool. Well, the store has those three rooms, you know, so I don't know which room you're uh, in. Okay, I think I, was, I think I was in the main room. Yeah, so that's the big showroom. And, you right. know... They built that later on. Richard Pryor could work out in there for his live on Sunset Strip. And that's actually, uh, originally that was Ciro's back in the day where like, you know, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack hung out and performed. It was like one of those kind of mob style stage right. showrooms, you know? Oh, sick. Yeah. It's yeah got it was a great, it was a, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It was a really good vibe though. Yeah, yeah. I recommend you check out the Comedy Store uh, documentary on, uh, I believe it's on Netflix, man. You'll love it. Okay, we'll do, yeah. Yeah. Now, let's dive into uh, who I think is the king of all kings, Jimmy Page. And you guys have had a great relationship with him over the years. You guys gave him uh, an award for, uh, Icon Award for Kerrang! Magazine. He gave you guys like your first, I think, what was it? The Brit Awards or whatever? Yeah. I mean. Yeah, it's wild, man. I mean, I, it, when we talk about it, I, I don't feel like we're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm so, yeah, I'm just so, um, so hypnotized by everything Led Zeppelin did. And it's, the whole reason this band exists, you know, we're kind of resting everything on the way they made music. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just, I, I just, my memories of like being like 18, listening to like Led Zeppelin just stoned out my mind, just staring into the speakers, just obsessed. And then now I'm, you know, now I'm sober and it, it, it it's, it, I'm just a stone. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. It's just, I'm, I'm obsessed. And, um, so just to be able to meet Jimmy was amazing. Um, but the first time we met, he was at our show, our kind of second US show ever at the Mercury Lounge in New York. And, uh, yeah, he was kind of at the right at the back by the, by the mixing desk and the dressing room for that venue you have to kind of come out the back and walk right. through the crowd. So we have to, we kind of walk straight past him and uh, yeah, man, I'll never forget that moment for the rest of my life. It was terrifying, but glorious, you know, because the minute we started playing, I saw his head moving and I was like, holy shit, like how is this real? <laughs> now It was just this tri trippy, trippy moment. Did you get a heads up that he was coming? How did this all happen? Yeah, I just think he happened to be in town. and We played on um, a show called Jules Holland, I'm sure you've heard of, in yeah. the UK. And I think he had seen us on that. And then, um, yeah, so it was all just kind of the stars aligning, really. So does he come backstage after the gig and start rapping with you? Yeah, yeah, we were just hanging out. I mean, I was only 20 three at the time so you'll you'll will find like pictures of it and we just kind of look like terrified God, yeah. um yeah but um yeah it was amazing yeah we just every time we hang out we just talk about music and you know he's obviously obsessed with music and um and i've got like a million questions <laughs> yeah um, and because he because he produced those records as well he's the recording process you know he's, he's fascinated with and something i'm keen to learn about as well so um yeah there's we're never kind of short of things to talk about yeah there's a there's i mean there's nobody ever like him ever again in that band he recently played like a couple of weeks ago at the rock and roll hall of fame and I was blown away. There he was because years have gone by and he has not played guitar. And I'm just kind of like, oh God, just just put together the firm again or something, man. Just we need one more Jimmy run, you know? Yeah, man. I'm with you. 
Yeah. Has he ever offered to produce one of your records or anything? No, we've never kind of had that chat. I mean, it's always just been about music. Yeah, I never kind of, yeah, never about that. Yeah. So that would be cool. I mean, that would be amazing. Where did you record the new record and who produced it? So we did it, but most of it at a studio called Rap in London, which is a really cool studio. Um, and then we produced it ourselves. Excellent. Um, yeah. Um, we have a good friend, Pete Hutchings, who's an unbelievable engineer. So, um, yeah, credit due to him because it was really, it was just the three of us in the studio for a month or so. Um, it was a lot of fun, man. Like, it, it made me realize how much of a kick we get out of the recording process as well. Um, we haven't used that, we haven't kind of had producers that much. Um, but um, yeah, it's definitely a lot of fun when you're kind of recording yourself. Oh man, that's, there's nothing better than recording, and then there's nothing better than playing live. They're two different animals, you know. Yeah, they're so different. Um, and I really like the live thing. I've always loved, and I still do. And and the recording thing is something that it's a kind of love that's built up over time. Now I think they're becoming quite equal. Um, I think on the second record, I was probably just nervous about making new material because it's the first time you're kind of creating knowing people are going to hear it yeah oh yeah you're right it's super weird to kind of like get used to that um so yeah but now i kind of yeah there's, I, I kind of yeah look forward to getting back into the studio looking back on it now um you know like typhoons i thought was a great record do you feel like of course, like I said earlier, a lot of those records disappeared, though. Um, you're out playing some of the songs in the set list, of course. Are you seeing, you know, people maybe just, oh, finally I get to hear this live. Maybe they didn't see any of the Typhoons tour or anything, you know? Yeah, I've got, I've got a bit of that feeling. Um, yeah, man, there's just like places that we played in Tulsa a couple of nights ago. And we hadn't been there in eight years. Wow. I was like, how is that? How has that happened? Um, so there's, I was thinking, man, like we've released three records since we've been here, you know? So um, every time I played a song, I was like, fuck, this is kind of like a new song for whoever came last time. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I do. I do get that sense. Yeah, that's great. You mentioned that you're sober now. Uh, did you have an incident or were you just ready to end, end partying? Yeah, just ready to end. I mean, it's coming up for 10 years on the road now and about five years into touring, I just kind of saw where it was heading. And I was like, I looked around me and I saw everyone else that was partying and I was like, this doesn't end well. Oh yeah, um, oh, you know, I was yeah. just like, oh, oh, I'm on this trajectory. Yeah. Um, so I kind of I jumped off the sinking ship, you know. Yeah, and you know what's great is how good you feel on tour when you're sober because you can get mm -hmm. up in the morning and you're just kind of like, oh man, I'm gonna go check out the town. You walk around a city or whatever, and you're like, I've been here three times. I've never even seen anything, you know? And it just starts to, uh, you sing way better. You're like, oh, wow, my yeah. voice is way better, you know? Totally. And also, like, your physical fit, like, for me, like, my physical fitness has become a big part of, yeah, a big part of my life and a big, and a big part of touring. Like, touring used to, like, slowly break me and kill me physically and mentally and now i feel like oh this is this is sustainable like you can you can do this and not sacrifice your body in the process yeah um so yeah man i'm kind of i'm all for it i'm sort of like it's hard to look back and be like oh 
wish I never did that because there was so so much of it was so fun and so funny. But I'm glad I kind of stopped what I did. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you it's gotta... kinda like it's kinda like leave like do you leave the party at like one AM or five AM? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can always tell a band's on another uh, trajectory is when I'm backstage and there's no more pizza and vodka. It's like fruit. There's uh, there's like yeah. salmon. There's a salmon. A, fucking, a blender. A blender. A blender. Maybe maybe a masseuse <laughs> comes in at 4.30. Uh, oh, man. We're not quite at the masseuse level yet, but yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. We need that shit. Oh, I want the fucking, uh, like the IV and the oxygen and all that shit. Yeah, yeah. That shit. Have, you played, have you played Red Rocks? Yeah, yeah. We played, oh, man, last time we played there, we were opening for Queens of the Stone Age. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which was obviously amazing. I just, I've just brought that up because the oxygen, I did Red Rocks, you know, and a comedian, you're not... You're not running around, so you don't need to go over and have some oxygen. But, you know, everybody's always like, the oxygen's right over there. <laughs> yeah, we did. Uh, we played in Denver the other night. And uh, in between, like, in between singing vocals, I was just realized, oh, my God, I can't fucking breathe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where did you play there? That kind of uh, small, cool little arena? We actually played in Inglewood. Um, I think it's called the Gothic Theatre, which gotcha. we've never done before. Yeah, um, it was, yeah, it was cool. How long is the tour uh, in the US right now? So we've only got six, uh, four shows left. Yeah, and then we uh, then we go to New Zealand and Australia. God, I haven't got there yet, man. I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, it's so good. Are you guys playing? Our so we yeah, so far away. Everyone would live there. Um, oh, I just, I just love it, man. You know, ACDC to Nick Cave. I'll take it all. You know, Tropical yeah, Fuckstorm. Yeah, all these great bands out there. Yeah, uh, Sniffers. You know, it just gets rocking out there. It does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great place. Are you guys playing on Thanksgiving tomorrow night? No, we're having. Uh, we actually have it. A day off, so we're gonna and we're gonna be in Austin. So uh, my my girlfriend's American, so I've been doing. I started doing Thanksgiving a couple of years ago, and I'm like all in. I love it. It's, yeah. I think it's better than Christmas. Yeah, it's like all the good shit, all the good shit from Christmas. So um, yeah, we're gonna have a little Thanksgiving. The band and uh, that band Hot Wax, they're gonna come and hang out. They've never done Thanksgiving, so we're gonna show them the ropes. I'll tell you what you try to do tonight after your gig is get over to Joe Rogan's club, the mothership there on sixth uh, street. It's one oh, of the shit. Is that going, is that going to yeah. be on? Yeah, that'll be on, man. It's one of the best comedy clubs ever, man. So, uh, I heard, you know what I was, um, yeah, fuck. I was thinking about, I was looking into that, but I thought, I don't know why, but I, I thought it was closed today and tomorrow, but I don't think so. I bet they're open tonight. Uh, but give it a spin. That would be amazing. Yeah, 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 I will. Is it hard? Is it hard to get into? Just getting kind of well, getting lined like the seller or something. Have your tour manager call over there, you know, and right. uh, and uh, I I can shoot a text over if you want. I'll find out if they're open and then uh, email me or have your uh, whoever hit hit me up on the interview and I'll see if I can get you in, man. Oh, mate, that would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, man, great new record. I really like it. Um, and I'm, I'm bummed I missed you guys. I think I was in Vegas when you're here because they invited me to go. And I was bummed. Oh, shit. Because I have not seen you since the Queens of the Stone Age tour because I, I tour nonstop myself. And I really want to see you guys again. And, and I have dove into this record and really, really like it, man. And uh, thank you so congrats. much, man. Yeah, it's it's great, man. The songwriting's great. The vibe, the flavor, like I said, especially that that back end of the record. It's just like, oh, excellent. And uh, I hope to see. I'm sure you'll probably come back through maybe in the summer or something. Uh, who I knows? hope so. Yeah, festivals or something. But congrats on uh, all all of your success. And uh, I, I've 
I've listened to the band for a long time now since I was turned on to you from the Queens tour. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing you again live, man. Thank you so much, man. Great to chat. Yeah. And uh, one last thing. So we got we got Royal Blood on Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff, right? And then the tour, yeah, yeah. the tour goes to New Zealand, Australia, and then what? Are you hitting Europe? No, we're playing Lollapalooza in in Mumbai. Oh, that. whoa! I know, I know. So um, that's going to be wild. And then we have a couple of months off, and then we're going to start touring South America and uh, play our first headline show in Mexico. Um, but yeah, man, we've got a lot of really exciting shit coming up. So um feeling good about touring, you know. Who's on that Lollapalooza? The Jonas Brothers. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I did see a wild lineup, right? It's really what it's, it's the most random lineup ever. Who else is playing? I have to go and double check. Go and check it out because it's really funny. It's like the post is, is really good. I did see it because I thought, oh, is this a spoof? You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, my man. Thank you so much. There, there you go, everybody. Tune in, check out the new record. It's fantastic. And go see Royal Blood out on the road. Thank you, my man. Take care, man. All the see best. You, see you, buddy.